I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your background, about growing up in Israel. You were born uh, in 1948 yes. during the War of Independence. And tell us a little bit about your family and where they came from and your sort of history. Well, both my parents were born in Israel. Uh, their parents came from the Ukraine and from White Russia and Poland. Uh -huh. um, the, both my, all my grandparents came during the time of the second Aliyah. Aliyah they were these uh, pioneers, uh, people who came from East Europe. Um, I was born in, in, in a moshav, which is some kind of an agricultural cooperative uh, Not village, unlike a kibbutz. Nahalal. It's, it's, it's a moshav. It's a little different than a kibbutz. Um, and I grew up most of my childhood in, in Jerusalem. Um, Your father was a poet? My father was a well-known poet uh, in Israel. Uh, Yitzhak Shalev. Uh, Yitzhak Shalev. His marriage to my mother were quite an event because of the different background. He was a sort of a right-winger. She was from a socialist. Uh, so it's a mixed uh, marriage. It, it is. And this tension, ideological tension was present in the house. And it was, I think it was very positive. Uh -huh. uh, um, and then, like everybody else, I, I did my army service during Six Day War. The, uh -huh. This this uh, time. And Where did you fight in the Six Day War? The Golan Heights. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, you now, I read somewhere because of the wonders of the internet that you uh, gave uh, uh, gave a, a lecture called "My Russian Grandmother and Her American Vacuum Cleaner." Yes, yes. W w what was that about? Well, uh, <laughs> it also has to do with Los Angeles because this is where my my the brother of my grandfather uh -huh. went to the to America instead of oh. doing uh, uh, Aliyah, making Aliyah to to, to Palestine. Uh -huh. And my grandfather was very angry at him. And the story is it's sort of mythological uh, uh, family story that he sent a huge vacuum cleaner from Los Angeles to the Valley of Jezreel <laughs> for my grandmother to clean her house. And my grandfather was very angry because he didn't want to use gifts that were sent from a capitalist country. <laughs> he was uh -huh. a socialist, almost a communist in a way. And uh, it became sort of a story in the family. And this is what I'm talking oh. about in my lecture. Now, now uh, you went to the Hebrew University yes. uh, um, and studied originally psychology. Yes. So, so you didn't have a, an ambition originally to be a writer? No, no, I just wasted three years of my life at the, the psychology department. Uh -huh. And then I started to work for the Israeli television and radio. Uh, as a host? Uh, as a in later stages, I became a host of, of a program. And towards the age of 40, I'm now 60 years old, I felt that I, I have to leave television be be before a permanent brain damage will will occur. And this is when I start, started writing. And, and your first novel was called, uh, here it's called Blue Mountain. Yes. It's called the Russian novel. Yes. Uh, um, and uh, what, what made you decide to write a novel uh, to, to, as opposed to a... I will tell you frankly, I wanted, I will, maybe it sounds like a cliche, but I wanted to live in peace with myself, do something mm -hmm. that I appreciate, do something that, that I like. Uh, I was always a great reader. There was always uh, a lot of literature and books in the house. Uh, reading was my main thing in life as a, as a young person. Now, when you re read the great novels, yeah. you read them in Hebrew, right? Yes, most of them I read in Hebrew. I, I could read. I can read only English and Hebrew. Ah, uh -huh. so so uh, <laughs> who were the novelists who? Inspired you and meant a lot to you, and you were so many of them. Uh -huh. Mainly, the, 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 my Russian trio uh -huh. are, are Bulgakov and Nabokov. Though writing most of his work in English, mm -hmm. still I consider him uh, Russian and Gogol. Uh -huh. um, I would say that from 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 America, it will be uh, uh, Faulkner and Mark Twain and Melville. Uh -huh. And again, most of these you read originally in Hebrew. These I read in Hebrew. Yes. Because it is interesting person, yes. that uh, modern Hebrew is a relatively recent phenomenon, and yet there's mm -hmm. been a giant literature. Yeah, but, but Hebrew was there all the time. Even when we didn't speak it or use it in daily life, it was there in prayer, in all texts that could be read and understood. It, it is a very unique uh, linguistic phenomenon. There is no language like that in the Western world where one can read 
a text that was written 3,000 years ago and understand most of it. Uh, you, you cannot give Virgil to a Roman kid of today yes. and he cannot read it. Mm -hmm. We can read uh, King David's words and if he entered this room right now, we, c we could talk to him a little, I will guess. Uh, he will be unfamiliar with the equipment. some of the slang. Yeah, but still, he yeah. will. He will. We, we could ask him some interesting questions. Uh, and and and, uh, and and writing was always there. And being people of the word and people of the letters and the text was there. And I think that the reviving it's not really uh, it's not resuscitation, but it's a reviving of the, yes, the of revival the language. Yes gave the language such new energy, which is hard to describe. We, we, there, is, is, there is a lot of writing in Israel in the Hebrew language today. And, and you uh, are uh, uh, particularly praised for your love of, uh, of language. You, you, I, you, that seems to matter a I great deal in your writing. It, it matters a lot to me, the use of the Hebrew language and the possibility uh, to use all the different layers of the Hebrew language where I can, in one sentence, mix the most modern street slang with the uh, uh, biblical uh, verse, and, and they mix beautifully together. And you've used biblical yes. references. You wrote a novel called Esau, yes. which uh, took the stories or the yes. and made them modern also, yeah, revived it. In, in, in all my books, I think there is some kind of biblical influence. Uh, I use biblical themes like like in, in the novel called uh, um, Esau, but also I try to adopt this uh, biblical technique, not the biblical style, but the biblical technique of not digging deep into the souls of your characters, but describe their deeds, their actions, their, uh -huh. their, their words, and let the reader decide uh, the psychological uh, part. But at the same time, your novels often have a metaphysical uh, aspect or a metaphorical, allegorical aspect beyond just action. I think that <laughs> I think you, you gave me a, a, a bigger compliment than I deserve. <laughs> I, 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 th I, I don't think I'm that metaphysical or mm -hmm. symbolical, but some, some stories I write I would I would say could not happen in reality, mm -hmm. but but this is something that that maybe I took it from the kind of stories I I heard as a young boy at the family table. My, uh -huh. my grandparents, my my parents, and my uncles and aunts were all great storytellers, oh. and they used to tell the most fantastic <laughs> stories, uh, especially the the farmer side of the family about the the, the they're talking animals and the flying donkey and the, the stories like this, which I loved as a, as a little boy, and later I made literary use in this atmosphere. And you've written children's books as yes, well. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, you, one of the uh, most uh, charming is one called My Father uh, Embarrasses Me, yes. which uh, 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 is a very sweet book, and I think uh, all of us who are parents uh, and who have been children ha have the experience of being embarrassed by mm -hmm. our parents, but also... Uh, yeah, this this book is sort of I would I think is the only the only time I tried to write an autobiography is, uh -huh. is this book. Uh, by the way, it was translated to, to many languages. Among them is Japanese as <laughs> well. And I got an article from Japan concerning this book about the father who embarrasses his, his children, where the writer was was amazed by by a Western. Uh, writer ability to go so deep into the psychology Japanese. of a Japanese family. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe it's universal. Yeah, it must be. And also, there's yeah. always bakers in your stories. Yes. Uh, Esau is a book about a family of bakers, yes. but there is nothing autobiographical yeah. about that. It's maybe just my love to the smell of bread. <laughs> Bakery. You know. Now, your, your new uh, novel, or most recent novel, yeah. which here is called The Pigeon and a Boy. Also in Hebrew, the same uh, title. Uh, and, and it... Um, it tells two stories, mm -hmm. um, one taking place in the present, one taking place uh, in 1948. Do you want to talk, tell us a little bit about yeah, it? Yeah, these, these are the, the, the two stories. Is the, the 1948 story is a love story between a boy and a girl who are both busy with handling homing pigeons for, for military use in, in the time of, of, of war. Uh, and homing pigeons were used in 1948, but they were also used by, by other armies. Uh, even in Second World War, there were still homing pigeons. 
uh, and and uh, this I can tell because it's already in the first page of the book. The the, the boy will be killed in 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 action, and he will send a last pigeon and the last uh, love letter to to his girlfriend. And and, uh, and they're young; they're uh, teenagers. They're they're eighteen, eighteen yeah. and a half. Uh, and the present day story is a story of an Israeli tourist guide married to an American uh, woman who lives in Israel and he finds himself and builds himself a new house uh, trying to leave his wife and he has a love affair with the, f the woman contractor who builds the house for him. And the two stories eventually meet. Uh, I don't I will not tell you no, how because I'll, this is the, the secret yes. of the story. I won't give it away either. Yeah, thank but, you. But, but the um, the tour guide uh, first of all, as an American, you know, it's an experience we all uh -huh. have of, of sort of meeting these characters yeah. who are... But he's, he specializes in bird watchers. Uh -huh. he, he takes bird watchers all around Israel because in Israel we have many migrating birds flying over yes. the country. In your, um, uh, in your book, the character, he, the present-day character, Mendelssohn, has a wife, a girlfriend, his mother. Uh, uh, even though he's the hero... Mm -hmm. He's very much, uh, his life is yeah. very much uh, uh, impacted this, by the women. But this happens in, other, um, in my all, all other books yes. that I wrote. And in a way, it's, it's also in, in my life, where I always felt not only surrounded by, by the women of the family, but I, as, as a younger person, I, I felt as one of them, in, in a way, because we are a big family. Uh, very big family, and my, my mother had seven brothers and, and wow. sisters. They all were very fruitful. I have <laughs> hundreds of cousins, and and uh, as as a young boy, I always heard the stories of my grandmother and my mother and her and her sister, and and I preferred to spend time with them. And I also physically, I look like the women of the family. I'm I'm short and dark haired, whether. Most of the men are taller, and some of them are uh, uh, blonde, and they and and um, so it was my it was my natural and state I, and I as a young boy to, to be with the women of the family. And I think you have a large female readership because they very much uh, relate oh. and uh, uh, to the women to the I way you write so. women. I hope so, but but this is true to many other writers because women read more than men. Yes, yes, yeah, and they they read more and they are more open to literature. Uh, than, than men. Now, uh, again, you have a story that takes place in 1948, mm -hmm. part of this book. And I was struck by recently, on, at the time leading up to Israel's 60th anniversary, it seems like people are talking about, in some ways, 1948. It, it's as if someone said to me, we're no longer arguing over 67. We're arguing over, we're talking about 48 again. Was this part of your consciousness, too? No. I, I used the war of 1948 because this this was the only war mm -hmm. in Is in Israel where homing pigeons were used, uh -huh. and I wanted this yes. story of a soldier, uh, a pigeon a pigeon handler of the army, being killed in war and sending a last homing pigeon, and and I could do it only in 1948. Uh, obviously, home is a big theme yes. in this novel, and and building a home, searching for home, the homing pigeons. I, I start, when I started using the homing pigeon in, in the book, I, I, I used them first as a, as a metaphor for, for the home feeling that the, you were just talking about. Um, and only later, the pigeons became some kind of heroes in, in the story by themselves after I did some research about the homing pigeons and, and I found what a great literary uh -huh. potential uh, they have, but home is and still is, uh, was and still is the the main theme of the book. And I wrote it after uh, uh, I found myself an, a new uh, home outside of Jerusalem without leaving my, my wife. <laughs> this is not autobiographical. We both use it happily uh, uh, because I felt that Jerusalem becomes heavier and heavier. For somebody like me who, who lives there and, and works there, um, it's a, sometimes I find it difficult to explain to, to an American public, especially Jewish public, who admire Jerusalem. And I say Jerusalem is a great place to long for and mm -hmm. visit and study 
and an experience, but living there is a completely different story. I, 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 uh, because? First, it's difficult? Because technically it's not a pleasant place to live in. The city is, is very crowded, very, uh, I would say, stupidly uh, 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 built and, and uh, uh, sometimes even dirty. But, but, but uh, it is more, this is when metaphysics com, <laughs> com, comes in. I, I would say that you feel in Jerusalem as if you are not considered by by the city, mm -hmm. the, the present day citizens of Jerusalem are not as important. Jerusalem as Jerusalem has, itself, as Jerusalem itself, and as the famous heroes she had in her past. Uh -huh. I mean, it's like uh, she always is concentrated. Uh, uh, I talk, I say she because uh, uh, town in Hebrew is is female, is feminine. Uh, uh, she's always, it's, it's like an older woman, like having an affair with an older woman <laughs> who had in her past uh, Albert Einstein and Warren Beatty and <laughs> Paul Newman and uh -huh. Casanova and uh, all the, the great uh, men of, of the past. And Jerusalem had King David uh, and, and uh, Salah ad and Richard the Lionheart and Jesus and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And Melville, my favorite uh, American writer uh, paid a visit to Jerusalem about 150 years ago and also Mark Twain, Twain both yes, of them yes. around the same uh, time. Twain was mocking at Jerusalem in a hilarious way, I yeah. think. And, but in Melville, a sense abroad, I believe, is the book, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and Melville made a very clever remark of a, of a short visitor. He, he said, Jerusalem is surrounded by cemeteries, and the dead are the strongest guild of this uh, city. And he was so right. Yeah. Uh, this is exactly what I was trying to, to explain, that the past of Jerusalem is always more important than the present, and about the future I don't even dare to make uh, guesses. Well, I, I won't take you exactly there, yeah. but I, I do know that uh, you continue to write a column Yes, in the newspaper. A, a weekly column. A, and in that you discuss... Uh, uh, I discuss uh, politics, culture, education, nature. I'm, I'm very free. I can write about anything I want. In Israel, the position of the novelist and the writer is very much a public figure who, who traffics in politics. Yeah, but there are writers who are more active politically than I am. I, I, I express my political opinion in the paper, but I would say that I'm much less politically involved or active there than other writers because I I don't like to to I, I don't want to, to this to be interpreted as a criticism about my colleagues and my friends. But uh, uh, first, I'm the son of a very political poet. My father right. uh, was a very political poet, and I always preferred his personal lyrical romantic poetry than his uh, political poetry. Uh, and the other thing is that, that I'm, I'm a little suspicious about promoting literature by politics or promoting politics by literature, and, and I would like to write my stories and not use them for something But I do else. think it speaks to the respect of the writer in Israel, it nonetheless, does. that people actually listen to what they yeah, have to say, yeah. which is not necessarily the case in yeah. other countries and certainly maybe not the case here as well. But the, also in fiction in Israel, there is a turn towards more personal, less yes. political fiction anyhow. My, my, my literature was always uh, more personal. I always described my stories within a historical frame that could be understood by, by the reader. But, and it was part of it. But, but uh, uh, these are not historical or political uh, uh, stories, and and uh, I, I write story. The stories I write are stories that I would like to read later. And and again, I don't like political uh, literature. On the occasion of Israel's sixtieth birthday, you wrote an essay yeah. where you that was sort of personal and political too. Yes, I, I do write my yes. political opinion in the paper yes. all the time, but not not in my novels. A and what do you think of the current situation? I, I, I lose my optimism very slowly, but, but steadily, because I feel that, the, uh, that we are past the point of no return, that there is, I'm afraid, the, the possibility of 
returning the territories that were occupied in 1967 and evacuating the settlers uh, from their settlements is no longer possible. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because? because? Because there are too many of them, and Israel uh, will not be able to, to, uh, to survive such a, a big operation. Um, and I think there will be no leader who will be uh, 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 strong and appreciated enough to move something uh, uh, like this. Had we had uh, people with the stature of Ben Gurion or Yitzhak Rabin, uh, maybe we could have done it. But also, years ago, to, today we have hundreds of thousands of people beyond the green line in the occupied yes. territories. And I don't see this possible, not only emotionally and politically, but also technically, I, I'm afraid it's impossible. Well, and, uh, and this means uh, that we are on a way towards a dead end uh, alley. And I, uh, this, this is what I am convinced in the last, I would say, three, four years beforehand. I still believed we could, we could, we could do it. And, and now I'm afraid it's, it's not possible anymore.